Good morning chaps. So I came in this morning with a little bit of trepidation hoping that obviously the HRT had come on and we didn't have the same mistake as yesterday but as soon as I walked through the door I could in fact hear the water a rumbling and you will too. So yes we have strike temperature has been hit 77, 78 degrees on the HRT there. That's perfect. So I'm gonna, as I say, pick up from yesterday's attempted vlog at what I do in the morning before I usually pick the camera up. So the first thing is mad rush now to get water flowing into the HL into the mash tun. Uh, whilst that's flowing in, I'll weigh out the um, the water treatment and uh, then by the time I've done that we should have enough water in the mash tun to start uh, actually giving it a stir and trying to achieve the correct temperature and I like to get the temperature of the mash settled within the first 15 minutes because today's modern, let me put you on the tripod today's modern well modified grains tend to do all of their conversion pretty much within within the first 15 minutes or so uh, so it's very important for me to achieve the correct mashing in temperatures so we're doing the bitter today Stuart managed to get some Nottingham ale yeast yesterday so I'm going to hook up the uh, the water to the mash tun and then we're going to weigh out our water treatment and uh, well I'll probably just play you some music that somebody will no doubt complain about. Cue the music. So going to do is just turn on the boil pump and recirculate some acid in the tank that I put in there yesterday. We're going to recirculate that through the plate chiller and through the transfer hose and make sure that that's sanitized before we get any work into the kettle. So I'm just going to attach this pipe work to the side here. Of course securing it with the retaining clips, one of which I've just dropped on the floor. So the reason I put the clips in, if you can hear me over there, is because this pump is quite powerful. So what I don't want to have is the hose falling off by accident. So let's turn this on. There's the boil pump. So it's flowing through the whirlpool arm. That's good, and now we're going to put it on to the plate chiller. And now it's flowing through, if you can hear me. So now it's flowing through the plate chiller and the hose, the transfer hose. So we're going to leave that for a minute, turn the music back up, and go and weigh out our water additions.
260 grams of AMS. Push that to the back a little bit. And then that is followed by 389 grams of DWB. So a lot of people ask me about how I've set the water chemistry for the vacant and all the other recipes. There's no point asking me about your water chemistry because I don't know where your base profile is. Go on Beersmith, look up Burton on Trent's water profile and try and make your water as close as possible to that. That's the only advice I can give you. So, the profile that I use is Murphy's Burton on Trent water profile, but I've punched that into BMS. So unless you get in touch with Murphy's of Nottingham and ask them what their profile is, then I'm afraid I can't tell you because they've worked it out for me. So the best thing you can do is use Beersmith or Easy Brewing Water and something like that. Get your base water profile down and then try and, uh, try and replicate Burton on Trent's. So that's the water chemistry touched on and weighed out. I'm gonna stick this in here like that. I generally wait until the hot water is visible in the tank before I add the AMS. I also dilute that AMS as well before it goes in so it mixes evenly. And then I'll be mashing in and uh, measuring the temperature. So you've obviously seen that 101 times so we'll come back after that segment. Right that's the mash all mashed as you can see looking steamy and beautiful. Our mash temperature for the best is 67 degrees we've got on here, if you can just make that out. 67.2, moving around a little bit, 67.1, 67. Perfect anyway, and that's with the long probe, so we're getting right down to the bottom. Pop that over there. And then what I like to do is take a large pint glass because it's got a lot of cold in it, if you know what I mean. It's a big heat sink. I'll take a little sample of the grain like this, swirl it round to cool it as much as possible, and it does cool it, and then we team that decent sample into a half pint glass, and that there is the pH sample that I'm going to use. So if I can put that there without it falling off, we'll shoot across to the lab area, if you like, or as I also call it, the kitchen. Uh, while we're here, we may as well stick the coffee machine on and then get a pH meter. Bit of a rinse under the water there. And then we're gonna stick this in. And of course, all you brewers out there, I know we're looking for about 5.2. This looks a little bit on the low side. We've got about 5, 4.9, 4.7, 4.6, 4.7, I mean 4.96, should I say. So what we'll do for a backup, just to make sure that one's reading correctly, we'll stick the other one in. They're cheap enough. Yeah, so that one's reading 5.1 or 5, this one's reading 5.9, there we go, 4.9, they're both at 4.9, so today we're a little bit low on the pH, that's fine, we can live with that, I don't like to add acids or anything at this late stage of the day, but what we will do with that information is we'll feed it back in and the next time we'll recalibrate so, I'll be writing that on here, but what I'll also be doing is rinsing out the glass. And this is an important step as well. We'll then take a reading of the water, so we know we can probably calibrate if the water is coming out at a specific pH, maybe it's a little bit lower today than usual, then we'll be able to see that on the brew sheet 
when we record all these numbers and the next time out we can just have a look at the water pH and uh, I'll by then hopefully have compiled a chart to go on the wall so if the water pH is down a little bit then we can change the AMS edition slightly so we don't have as much acid in there to, uh, to alter the pH of the mash and keep it around 5.2 so that's the pH side of things completed excuse me for the wobbly camera se segment there so what I also like to do at this stage is put some more water in the HLT because we don't have enough capacity in there at the moment so I filled that up with another 100 or 2 litres of water so that will now start to reheat again back up to 77 for sparge and then what I'm also going to do now is pop the lid on the mash tun of course and then over here the next job is to set up this tank this bad boy with a pump and a spray ball and this has got some caustic in it you'll remember we saved the caustic from the weekend so that caustic that we saved from the weekend is now going to be reused and we're going to uh, clean clean this tank with it that's the plan anyway you catch my drift I'll come back to that once we've got the mash tub put to bed covered up and put to bed because we want to retain we want to retain that heat that we've got I know I'm a little bit all over the place folks it's difficult to do a time sensitive job whilst at the same time point a camera in the right direction without a cameraman or woman we'll just rinse off our mash paddle like so that's good to go for tomorrow and then we'll put the lid on there we go so she's put to bed you just saw that I think it was in shot I'm gonna clean this up and get that pump on the go and then uh, we'll come back when I remember what I've got to do next I can't remember so it's at this point now where the mash is coming to an end we're actually doing the vol off in here I've turned the main could that bloody fly I've turned the main uh, caustic pump off on FV1 and I've emptied the acid out of the fermenter ready for the transfer and I've killed the radio that's why it's quiet so it's at this point when I may take a little sample in this dish and we're going to do a bit of an iodine test so I try to do these all the time because they're just so easy to do and uh, it just gives you peace of mind that conversion has happened so we've got a clean plate and we've got a couple of drops of iodine iodine and as you can see looking at the colour there I can't see any black it's remained brown we don't want to mix it in too much because we want to see the interface between the iodine and the wort looking, we're looking for starch molecules and as you can see there aren't any there so that is what you'd call a positive iodine test and you know what probably going to make a really good thumbnail <laughs> so that's passed just be careful not to tip it back into the uh, into the mash we're going to wash that away of course and uh, the next step now in four minutes is to transfer this across to the boil kettle of course and sparge with hot water which is you'll be pleased to know up at 77 degrees just in time so during the sparge we have a little bit of time to spare because it's a waiting game essentially for this to transfer into here so I use this time to A set up the vacuum pipe for the uh, for the condensing flue 
So as that condensing fluid is drawing the steam out of the boil, we need to draw air in to replace it. And I used to just leave this CIP fitting open, but what was happening was occasionally we'd get a little bit of a boil over and it'd pop out of here, meaning all the top of my boil kettle would be covered in sticky sugars. So I just put this little vacuum pipe on and it was only because it was a bit of spare 22 mil pipe and that vents down here just at the side of the capture bucket for the condensation so if it does boil over just goes into that vent bucket and away out of this tube down the drain uh, so yeah we stick that on and it just helps prevent the boil kettle getting messy and then also what I've done is because we've got some new hops in then I've run upstairs and we've got some new malt I've run upstairs and I've punched all the numbers into Beersmith. Here it is, Guile 55 of the English Bitter. There's a bit of a cheat for you guys who might want to copy it. I don't mind. And then on here, I've just taken the alpha acids and I also took the colour of the malts. You'll see that the black pattern's changed, it's 1357. Previously it was uh, 900 and something, so it's a little bit darker on the EBC. And uh, the Challenger hops and the Golden hops, um, Alpha Acids, have changed slightly. Uh, they were set, I think, at, um, that was 7.1. I know it's not changed a lot, and this was a different number, 5.2, I think, perhaps. So I've altered that, which has meant overall a reduction in the bittering addition. So instead of 665 grams of Challenger at 7 point, at whatever it was, at 7.2 alpha, we only need 558 grams to achieve the same bitterness profile in the beer as we had on the last batch. So to maintain consistency, we just nip upstairs, punch in the new numbers, the recipe is then altered for the next time round when we uh, produce this again until we get a new batch of hops in. So I'm gonna weigh those out now and they'll be ready to go in, I would imagine, within the next 40 minutes or so when that sparge is completed. So I've taken the opportunity while I'm waiting for the sparge to happen to lay this tank down on its back and what I'm also gonna do is remove these feet so I can give them all a really good, just turn that round, give them all a really good clean before we put these tanks into action because the feet are the dirtiest bit on the whole tank. So if we take them off, take them across to the sink individually and give them a good scrub, oil them up, lube the bearing racers and then come and put them back together I think we'll have a better looking set of tanks probably not necessary but I don't want to start a project which is too bearing overbearing while I'm brewing because what tends to happen is the beer suffers a little bit as I get so distracted so at least with this I can just do them at my leisure and uh, it's only a case of cleaning some wheels up so I can drop it when the alarm on the brew kit starts to sound. So yeah, I don't know if I mentioned it but I've also put the foam in around the bottom and while it's on its back as well I'll probably go forwards with putting the cone insulation on there also because that's the last stage and then all these tanks will be insulated and ready for use. And there we have it, one big relatively grubby caster. So the Persid is now out of the fermenter and we have the transfer hose attached. As you can see, we're coming across 
at 18.6, uh, 18.7 degrees C. And if we trace it back, you'll see I've dug out the mash. That's going to go to Billy the sheep. And uh, the mash tun has been cleaned out and is ready for the next batch of malt, which is all weighed out here, ready to go. And on the plate X, we have the work going in. That feels just about right temperature. A uh, rule of thumb, as they say. Uh, and in the meantime, while we were waiting for the boil to complete, I fetched down some of the uh, foil-backed insulation foam, which is adhesive on the back there. And we cut the cones for two of the fermenters. Seeing as I've got them laid on their backs, it's going to be easier for me to stick these on now. So we just went upstairs, we took the measurements, so the radius for the top of the cone was uh, 450, the radius for the bottom of the cone was 30, and the height of the cone was 620. Then we went upstairs to our trusty Russell Craig, or Craig Russell even, uh, webpage, Craig Russell, and uh, this will calculate a cone for you. So 201 degrees, that is essentially 201 degrees around here, like this. So if I open up one of these, you'll be able to see exactly how this cone calculator works. So you can see what we've had to do. You just take, hold on, I'm doing a good job of not getting this in shot. There we go. So it's flat. You've just got to remember that, that you're drawing it out flat. So your radius two, 802 millimeters here, is this leg. So it's from the center of this here, out to there, 802 mil. Radius one was 53, that's from there to there. So we just cut that circle out, of course. And then when you've got your 100 802, or whatever it is for your particular cone, then you're gonna go 201 degrees around. So you'll get a straight edge, have one end anchored there, and then scribe a circle. Out she goes, all the way around to the other side until you get to 200 and whatever degrees, or whatever it is for your particular cone. So you can see it makes basically a Pac-Man. And then when you come to fold this together, like that, it makes the cone that you require Probably better to see it on the outside than it has in the end. Anyway, here's a finished article. And what I've done is I've actually overrolled this a little bit. You can see the overlap there between the front and the back, these two sections. So that's overrolled now, so it's a bit of a tighter cone. So when I put it onto the tank, it isn't going to want to force itself off because unfortunately these rolls of insulation come rolled in the opposite direction with the adhesive on the outside which means that unless you reverse it and let it settle for a bit it tends to want to ping off a bit like this one that's not been rolled yet so I'll step over that we'll come back out and that cone has been designed to of course fit on the bottom of this tank so we're going to put him in there and we're going to stick him on before we stand him up and then they will look like these tanks so they still look like they're made out of stainless steel don't they but in actual fact it's the adhesive creating a little bit of insulation for us that's spot on so in the end i decided to flip the whole thing upside down and it kind of worked. It made it really easy for me to put this insulation on. And uh, to finish it off, what I'm going to do, well, I've put a bit more foam around the edge here just to tidy this up so it's fully insulated. And I am tempted to just cover it in silver foil, but I'm not sure yet. If I'm going to do it, I'll do it while it's laid on its back like this so you won't see it. But quite frankly, the foam will obviously turn a very similar colour to the timber, so maybe if I just flip it the right way up and leave it, the timber is of a low enough level that when you stand and look at the other tanks, for instance, you can't really see underneath 
that edge if you know where I'm coming from. So once all this is tucked up, you don't really look under there. So I think we might get away with leaving it. And then in the meantime, while I was doing that, the John Guest fittings arrived for the pilot kit. So these are the ISO valves. Fucking expensive ISO valves, I'm telling you. You won't believe that there's 80 quid in this bag, would you? Silly money for these uh, these fittings. Five are a piece. But yeah, these are the ISO valves that we're gonna be using on top of the fermenters so we can take them away, sanitize and clean them at the sink, but not lose any glycol, which I explained about on yesterday's vlog, I think it was. Anyway, we're about to uh, complete the transfer. So I'm just gonna go and watch the rest of the boil kettle, make sure that uh, we don't drag too much trub into the pump. And then once that's done, we'll be putting the yeast into the, into the, into the beer, into the fermenter. We're using Nottingham Ale yeast on the bitter. And then I'll stick some caustic in the tank, set everything to come on in the morning. And then when I arrive, the tank will have ran in the morning for a few hours and it should be clean, ready for tomorrow's brew day. That is the plan. It really is that simple. So that pretty much is the brew day. Chance looks like he's ready to go home. <laughs> he heard me get the camera. So we've just got to pitch the yeast. We've got all of the equipment over there set and ready to come on in the morning, including the CIP. So it'll start cleaning itself as well as heating the water up first thing in the morning. Before I arrive, I just need to rinse out and recirculate a bit of acid through the plate chiller and we're ready to go again. The gravity that I'm looking for for the bitter is 10.39.1 to 10.40.01 or 10.40, oh yeah, 10.40.01 and you can see on the psychrometer that we've got here that we are 10.30 9.5.4 point point 10.39.4 so we're kind of bang on the freaking money 1.0394 bingo so there we are so that will be hopefully on target when it finishes fermenting and then we've just got to grab out of our fridge here a little bit of Nottingham Ale yeast. This has got really expensive. 57 quid I paid for that packet. It's unbelievable. So we're just going to stick 500, no, 250 grams of this in. And uh, that's it. We're done for the day. And I almost forgot obligatory on every batch is to assess the colour, see if it kind of matches what we were looking for on our Beersmith profile. Generally this tends to be a little bit lighter. So what do you think? Not far off, right? And then the obligatory taste test. And it tastes about on the money to me. So, that's it folks, I'm going to wrap the vlog up, I'm going to go home, I'm going to cook myself some tea and uh, we'll do it all again tomorrow, so if you'd like, you can join me, we'll see you there.